Thanksgiving, as you well know, Thanksgiving is always a season where we tend to be so thankful about the abundance of God. And the horn of plenty has always represented the faithfulness and the fruitfulness of God. Well, this month I'm preaching about a believer's inventory of being thankful. And I am not focusing on what's on the table at your home this Thanksgiving or even in your refrigerator, I am focusing on taking inventory of being thankful to the abundance that God has blessed you and I with spiritually. This morning I'm preaching Psalms 145 verses 3, 8, and 9. And so as I talked about being thankful for a unchanging God last Sunday, this morning I want you to join me as I talk about taking inventory and being thankful for God that is unequal, I want you to like and share. Let someone know that the Second Baptist Church of Battle Creek is now about to have morning worship and the pastor will be preaching about a unequal God. I want to tell you in the Word of God, I want to prove by the Word of God that our God is unequal equal. So come on now and join us as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Good morning. Welcome to Second Missionary Baptist Church this morning. We welcome all of you who are members and those who are Christians and friends. The scripture today comes from Psalms 145 verses 1 through 8. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee. I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy words to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great of mercy. God's word for God's people. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we come again this morning with bowed heads but with uplifted hearts. As always, Lord, we come with an attitude of thanksgiving realizing that we just can't thank you enough for all of the many blessings, both large and small, that you bless us with each day. We just come, Father, thanking you for your grace this morning. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for those new mercies morning by morning. Lord, we just can't thank you enough for who you are in our lives. You said in your word, Lord, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And I know that you're keeping us 
in these perilous times of this pandemic that we are experiencing right now. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We just thank you for everything you are to us. We just ask, Father, that you would abide in us as we go through this morning service. Guide us and lead us in the way that you would have us to go. Well, Father, we just ask that you bless each one with a blessing that you see that we all stand in the need of. We will always be careful, Lord, to give you the honor, the praise, and the glory in all that we do. We offer this prayer in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. <music>
trust me. Trust me. I'll never leave you. Psalms 145, you heard that read in your hearing this morning from Deacon Collins. I want to anchor my thoughts on verses 3, 8, and 9, Psalms 145. I want to talk about this morning an unequaled God. A God that is unequal. There is a hymn that we sing in the church or perhaps a praise song. It's probably more of a doxology kind of song. 
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures below. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I praise the Father for being the creator. Psalms 8 tells us that, that God, the Father, was the creator. It opens up by saying, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all of the earth. When I consider the heavens, the moon, and the stars, the works of your fingers, when I consider that, how you have placed all of that in place, I give you the praise. So I praise the Father for being the creator. And as being the creator, he gave us creation. And because he's the creator that gave us creation, he also created creatures. So I praise the Father. But not only do I praise the Father, I praise the Son. I praise the Son for being our Redeemer and for his redemption. No man took his life, according to the New Testament. No one took his life. He laid it down. He laid his life down, and in laying his life down, he reconciled us back to God. So I praise the Son for being our Redeemer and for the redemption that he has brought us. So I do praise the Father, I praise the Son, but I also praise the Holy Ghost. I also praise the Holy Ghost because it is his ministry that sustains what the Father and the Son has already done. So our thanks to God ought to be perpetual. But we know from life that it is so possible to be so blessed and to be so engaged, and to be so engulfed in life, and to be so engaged in the busyness of life, that you can so easily forget to acknowledge the blesser of life. The gospel truth is God is always blessing us. That's the truth of the matter. We say it, I think we say it, because it is without a doubt real and ritual, but God is always blessing us. We, we sing about that in the church. The Lord is blessing me right now. The hymn goes on to say that he woke me up this morning, clothed in my right mind. The Lord is blessing me right now. Psalms 145 is a psalm where the psalmist gives both reverence and recognition to the blesser. I like that about this psalm because the psalmist does not put emphasis on the blessings as much as he places emphasis on the blesser. He's not giving thanks so much for any of the substance in his life. He's really giving praise and thanks to the supplier of all of his life. He recognizes that his blessings are not so much because of his character and because of his commitment, but his blessings is because of the character and the commitment and the compassion of God who sends all of the blessings. He's not so much giving thanks for his personal possession. He's giving thanks for the spiritual things that are on the shelves of his life. Well, on last week, as I preached to you, as I began this series that I entitled A Believer's Inventory of Thanksgiving, I began the series talking about perhaps the first thing and perhaps the foremost thing that you and I as believers ought to be thankful for, that we ought to be thankful for an unchanging God. 
I talked to you on last Sunday from Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. But Malachi writes that I am the Lord and I change not. And in that sermon, I said to you that we ought to be thankful that the God we serve, first of all, we ought to be thankful he is an unchanging God and that, number one, his love is unchanging. I know you ought to be glad that you serve a God whose love is unchanging because we live in such a changing world and we're around so many people who are always changing. Actions and attitude changes, but I'm glad that we have a God whose love is unchanging. But not only is his love unchanging, his loyalty is unchanging. I'm glad of that. I'm glad that God's loyalty to me is unchanging as well as to you. But not only does God's love does not change and his loyalty does not change, but the loftiness of God is also unchanging. So this morning, I want to just drop my anchor here as I talked to you on last Sunday about being thankful. A part of your inventory is to be thankful for a God who's unchanging. Well, this morning, I want you to look at and think about and reflect upon a God who is unequal. I, I believe that you would really think about that if you thought about it at depth. You would recognize that our God is a God that is so unequal. Here is, here is for me the essence of what this text is going to say to us. The essence is that as believers, we are incomparably blessed because our blessings come from an incomparable God. I'll say it again, and then I'm going to say it another way. As believers, we are incomparably blessed because our blessings come from an incomparable God. Well, here's a other way we can say it. As believers, we can't get blessed any better because we are already blessed by the best. We can't ever be blessed any better because we are already blessed by the best. He's the best God that could ever bless you. You will not find another God who can bless you like this God can bless you. That is what the psalmist says. You can just see it as it emanates from the pages of Holy Writ. In those verses that you heard read this morning, you can see it in verse 3. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, Great is the Lord, and great to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. That is the first thing about this God that I am defining as being unequal. Our God is a great God. The, the scripture says it, that great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. May I say to you that what makes God an unequal God is that our God is a great God. There are a couple of things I think that makes God such a great God. First of all, he is almighty in his name. I said he's almighty in his name. There is no name like his name. You know, Moses was introduced to God on the mountain in a burning bush. Moses needed God to tell him what his name was. He needed that to at least tell Pharaoh who was it that sent him who had the audacity to say to the king of Egypt, let my people go. Moses says, well, when I go to Pharaoh, at least tell me your name. Tell him, uh, at least who I can tell him sent me. God says to Moses, when you go down there, just tell Pharaoh that I am sent me. What a, what a marvelous in a masterful way of God introducing himself. He tells Moses, when you get to Egypt, just say, I am sent me. Moses was not aware 
at the burning bush. He was not aware on the mountain the moment of fullness of the name of God because Moses would only discover the power and the fullness of the name of God as he walked with God. May I tell you that the only way you can ever understand and know the fullness of God, you got to spend some time walking with God and God walking with you. The only time you can know the fullness of God's name, you got to have some trials and some tribulations. You got to have some downs. You got to have some testing. You will never know the fullness of God's name just in one moment. Moses heard him say, I am that I am, but Moses had no idea what that I am really meant. Moses had no clue that when, he, when God said to him that I am that I am, Moses had no idea of the fullness of that name. Because you really never know the fullness of God's name until you tried him. Elijah on Mount Carmel discovered the fullness of the power of that name. You know the story. Elijah is in, in the land of Samaria and Jezebel and Ahab has sent 850 prophets to fight him or to challenge him on Mount Carmel. As Elijah is on Mount Carmel and 850 prophets of Baal are all around him, he's there all by himself. Elijah said, I tell you what, we'll see who's God. You call on your God and I call on my God. You take the morning shift, I'll take the afternoon shift. You call on Baal, I'll call on my God. And the God who answers by fire is the real God. Well, you know the story. The prophets of Ahab and Jezebel started calling on Baal. Baal, won't you come by here? Baal, won't you show up? Baal, and as the old preacher would say, Baal had eyes, but Baal could not see them. Baal had legs, but Baal could not get to them. Baal had arms, but Baal could not pick them up. Baal had ears, but Baal could not hear them because Baal was nothing but a stature, an idol god. Bible says they called on Baal from morning to noon. And by the time the clock struck noon, Elijah said, your time is up. It's my time to call on God now. It's my time to call on the name of God that I know. Elijah slips away over to a corner. He prays to God. He said, now God, I want them to know that you are really God. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to dig a trench around the altar. And I'm going to take 12 barrels of water and pour it over the altar. And when I call on you, God, I want you to come. But I don't want you to come in a natural way. I want you to come in a supernatural way. I want you to come by fire. And not only do I want you to come by fire, but I want you to come in a supernatural fire. Because, you know, the natural thing is water puts out fire. I want you to come and I want the fire to lick up the water. And Elijah called on God. When Elijah called on God, God came down in a supernatural fire. And the Bible says, and the fire started licking up all the water around the altar. There is nothing like the name of God. His name is an almighty name. Come here, David. David would tell you that his name is an almighty name. David stayed, stood against Goliath. And when he goes out to fight Goliath, he walks up to Goliath. And all he has in his hand is a slingshot and five rocks. Goliath comes out, sword, spear, helmet, breastplate. Elijah, David stands before Goliath, and, and Goliath is cursing David. He is calling David everything but what he is named. He is insulting David. He is offending David. He is saying to Israel, you sent a boy to do a man's job. He is, he is hurling insults to David. And finally David says, I tell you what. He says, you, you come against me with a sword. And you come against me with all this profanity. But I come against you in the name of a mighty God. I want to tell you there's something about that name. 
just this past week, Rance Island, famous gospel singer, just closed his eyes and went on into eternity. Rance Island had a song that says there's something about the name of Jesus. I want to tell you, I know what it is. It's an almighty name. Rance Allen said it soothes all of your doubt. I need to remind you that our God is a great God. And what makes God so great is he has an almighty name. There is no name like his name. You know, when you mention the name Bill Gates, you tend to think about money or Microsoft. When you mention the name of Serena or Venus Williams, you tend to think about excellence in tennis. When you mention the name of Tiger Woods, you think about perfection of a golf game. When you think about a Michael Jordan, you think about a name that is prominent and the best NBA player who ever come through. But when you think about the name of Jesus or God, it's a name above every name. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the day is going to come where every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is no name like his name. It's an almighty name. That's what makes him great. What makes him great is that he has an almighty name, but not only what makes him great is the mere fact he has an almighty name. What makes him great, he can supply almighty need. He has, he, he's able to handle our needs. He has all might in meeting our needs. Not only does he have an almighty name, he's almighty in meeting our needs. May I suggest to you that if you walk in faith, you will discover like Moses did the fullness of that name you will discover that that name is able, that name is capable, that name has the power, that name has the ability to meet your needs. There is no need that you can have in your life that he cannot meet it. There is no situation in your life that he cannot handle. There is no struggle that he cannot get you through. It is a name that can meet not only your, your it, is, it is an almighty name. Not only can he handle it because of his name, he can handle it because he is a need meter. He can meet your needs. He can meet my needs. He has met your needs. He has met my needs because there is something almighty about him meeting our needs. Come here, Moses. Moses did not know on the mountain when God told him his name was I Am. Moses had no idea on the mountain that this, this I Am could meet every need because only thing Moses knew was his name was I Am. But when Moses got to Egypt, he discovered the fullness of his name. Moses get to Egypt and Pharaoh doesn't want to let the people go. Moses discovered that Egypt didn't have a God. The Egypt didn't have a God who could even compare to his name. Those ten plagues that Moses brought on Egypt were ten plagues against the gods of Egypt, the gods of lice, the gods of fire, the flyers, the gods of the water. God showed Moses in Egypt with those ten plagues. There is no name greater than his name. You know, I love to uh, watch the story uh, of Ten Commandments. I love to watch that story when uh, Cecil B. DeMille uh, uh, has Pharaoh standing before their Egyptian god, Dagon. Your Brenner is standing there before the Egyptian god, Dagon. He has his dead son. Uh, because that tenth plague killed the firstborn in Egypt. And I like the way that Cecil B. DeMille uh, portrayed that idea, that, that Ewell Brenner brings his dead son, and he brings him up to the god of death of Egypt, and he, he brings him up to him and gives him to him, the god of death and life. And he says, oh, great Dagon, bring back my son, and yet, as he stands there, he stands there, and that son cannot rise from the dead. And the reason is because Dagon was no comparison to the name of God. There, there was no way that Dagon could ever do or bring back a life that God had allowed to be taken away. There is no name like his name. I don't want to tell you that our God is a great God 
because our God is a God who has an almighty name. Our God is a great God, not just because of his name, but he knows how to meet our needs. And Moses had to understand that. Moses had to walk with God. Moses had to have some trials. Moses had to have some tribulation. Moses had to have some tests to discover the fullness of that name. When Moses got to the Red Sea and the people were murmuring and crying and said, Moses, you mean to tell me that you brought us out to the wilderness to die? We could have stayed in Egypt and died in Egypt. And think about it. The Red Sea was before them and the mountains were on both sides of them and Pharaoh was behind him and Moses is wondering how we're going to get out of this. But remember, he is the God that says, I am. Moses is standing there and I'm pretty sure he's afraid. He's not sure how God is going to do it. He doesn't know what God is going to do. And God said to Moses, stand still, Moses, and see the salvation of the Lord. And he tells Moses, stretch out your rod in your hand. And the Bible says that when Moses stretched out the rod, the sea backed up. Moses discovered at the Red Sea that their name was powerful enough to divide the Red Sea. Sometimes you'll never know how powerful the name is until you have your own Red Seas. That when you have your own Red Seas, you will discover that God can part your Red Seas. When the children of Israel crossed over the Red Sea and then the next few days, they are hungry. They don't have bread to eat, and they're murmuring again. Bible says that God sent manna from above. Every morning, that was bread on the ground. Moses discovered not only is God a bridge over troubled water, God is also bread when you're hungry. When the children got to a place where the water was bitter and bad, and they cried, they had no water, then God told them, just listen to me, and God took bitter water and made bitter water sweet. Moses discovered that God was water in dry places. Forty years the children of Israel walked around in the wilderness and the Bible says as they walked in the wilderness their shoes didn't wear out nor did their clothes. Moses discovered not only is God a way through a red sea, not only is God bread when you're hungry, not only is God water in a dry place, not only will God provide for you, God will make sure he can take care of you for 40 years and your shoes don't wear out and your clothes don't get worn out. God is an awesome God. It's one thing I love about God. God is an unequal God. And you have to be thankful for the mere fact that our God is unequal. That old song that we sing oftentimes in a church, that God specializes in things that are impossible. That hymn says, do you have any tunnels that you cannot tunnel through? You know, do you have any mountains that you cannot get through? Do you have any valleys you cannot cross? I want to remind you that God specializes. There is nothing in your life that God cannot specialize in. If you're hurting, God has a way of bringing you through your hurt. If you feel hopeless, God has a way of giving you hope. If you're down, God has a way of picking you up. If you've been bruised and battered, God has a way of mending your broken heart. I want to remind you that I am God specializes. Our God is a great God. And what makes God so great is he has an almighty name and our God is almighty and meeting our needs. Well, verse 9 says that the Lord is good to all and that his tender mercy is over all of his works. Now our God is not only is our God a great God, but our God is also a good God. That's what the scripture says. The Lord is good. You know, I'm in this season of life where I find joy in each day. And I don't find joy in each day because life is good every day. But I find joy in each day because I have learned and I am learning that regardless of what my day may be like, God is good every day. 
I'm learning really to be thankful for a good God every day, even when I've had a bad day. Because the truth of the matter is that when I look over my shoulder, I'm sure you can do, when you look over your shoulder, you see places where you should have been defeated. When you look over your shoulders, you see places where you could have been destroyed. When you look over your shoulders, you see places where you could have been abandoned. When you look over your shoulders, you see places where you could have given up on yourself and given up on God. But I'm so glad I'm learning to find joy each day, not because every day is a good day, but every day I got a good God. And it's, it's because I have a good God that because on bad days, on dark days, on driven days, on disappointing days, on sad days, on down days, I still believe in the goodness of God. God is a good God. Well, we do it all the time. I wish you were here in the sanctuary with me so I could ask the question, when is God good? When is God good? I know in my congregation, if I ask that question, when is God good? The response would be all the time. May I tell you, God is good all the time. Every day, he's a good God. All the time, he's a good God. There is never a time that God is not good. There is never a season in my life or in your life that God was not good. He is not good. Even when I think about seasons that were not good, God is still good. He's a good God. Even when life takes on what I may call a damnable and a doomed situation, I've discovered that he's a good God. And even when I'm going through whatever I'm going through, when you're going through whatever you're going through, when life is not good, God stands on the other side of the other side of what you're going through. He stands there to wait till you get through it. And he will remind you that even when you were going through what you were going through, I was still a good God. And I'm going to stand here on the other side to wait till you come out of what you've been going through so I can make sure you know that I'm still a good God. He's a good God. Just this past Sunday, I watched as the wind was blowing, the snow was coming down. And I noticed where all the leaves were just blowing from this place to that place, and it was cold outside. But right on the other side of the house, there is an evergreen tree. And the evergreen tree was just standing right there and the leaves were blowing and the snow was coming down and it was cold on the outside and the leaves had turned brown. But the evergreen tree was still evergreen. It was made to be an evergreen that it didn't make any difference what season it might be. If it's summertime, it's still an evergreen tree. If it's springtime, it's still an evergreen tree. If it's fall, it's still an evergreen tree. If it's winter, it's still an evergreen tree. When the wind is blowing, it's still an evergreen tree. When the storm is raging, it's still an evergreen tree. It was made to be an evergreen tree. I want to remind you, God was made to ever be good. He's good in the morning. He's good at noonday. He's good in the midnight hour. He's good when I'm well. He's good when I'm sick. He's good when I'm up. He's good when I'm down. He's good when I'm full. He's good when I'm hungry. He's good when I'm happy. He's good when I'm sad. He's good when I got something. He's good when I have nothing. He's good when I'm happy. He's good when I'm sad. He's good all the time. He's a good God. David's testimony is that he's a good God. You, you know that story. And I like that story about David. When David is having all these victories in life, he's beating every nation that he goes against. He's winning every battle. He's been heralded as a great king and a great administrator. Every nation is afraid of David. There is no foe that can beat David. And David starts to celebrate his victories. David starts to celebrate who he is. He starts to think more of himself than he should. He says, what I need to do is take inventory of my soldiers. 
I need to know how many men are in my army. The prophet comes to David and says, David, the Lord sent me to you to tell you, don't, don't number your soldiers. Don't, don't spend no time counting how many foot soldiers you have, how many soldiers you have in chariots, how many soldiers you have on horses. Don't, don't spend time taking an assessment of how many people you have fighting in your army. Don't, don't do it, David. Because, David, you need to realize that the reason you're winning these battles has nothing to do with how many are fighting in your army. It has nothing to do with the strength of your men or the strategy of your generals. The reason you're winning has nothing to do with swords and horses and chariots. The reason you're winning has nothing to do with your battle plan. The reason you're winning is not because who's fighting for you. It's really on who's on your side. But no, David, David, so into himself. He was so into accolades and honors. He was so into being self-aggrandized. He counted his soldiers anyway. And as he's halfway counting the soldiers, the prophet comes back to David. And the prophet said, now David, I told you that God told me to tell you, don't count your soldiers. Don't spend any time taking an inventory of how many you got fighting for you because your victory is not predicated on the number of men in your army. Your victory is not because of your generals and your foot soldiers and your horses. Your victory has nothing to do with human hands. Your victory is because of the divine hand of God. God told me to tell you that he's mad at you and he's disappointed with you and he's displeased with you. And so as a result of disobeying him, here is your punishment. You can have three years of famine. David says to the prophet, no, I can't do that. I can't have three years of famine because that means that innocent people will have to pay for my sins. Three years of famine ultra would mean that there would be no rain falling from the sky. And David knew the impact of a drought and no rain. If no rain fell in Israel, that meant that the grass wouldn't grow. If the grass didn't grow, that meant that the cows wouldn't have any grass to eat and the cows would die. If the cows died, that meant that the babies wouldn't have no milk on the table. And if there was no grass growing in Israel, that meant that the sheep wouldn't have any grazing grass to nibble on. And if the sheep died, that meant there'd be no wool in the wintertime. There'd be no mutton on the table to eat in the winter if, if that happened. David realized that no, famine is too severe. Too many people will be hurt. Too many people will die. David says, no, I don't want three years of famine. Prophet says, well, here is the second choice. You can have three months in the hands of your enemies. Well, David didn't even have a discussion with the prophet about that because David had been too ruthless. He had been too overwhelming. He had been too vicious to put himself Three months in the hands of his enemies. He had too many enemies who wanted to get even. So David didn't even discuss that. He just outright said, no way. Then the prophet says, well, here is the third punishment. You can have three days in the hands of an angry God. David said right off, I'll take that. I'll take three days in the hands of an angry God. Because David said, even though God may be angry with me, even though God may be displeased, even though God may, 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 may be angry and mad at me, but I'll take three days in the hands of an angry God because even if he's angry, his mercy endures forever. David could tell you he's a good God because he writes, oh, taste and see <laughs> that the Lord is good. Yes, David would tell you he's a good God. 
And so if I was in this church with folks today, I would say, <laughs> when is God good? And they would say, he's good all the time. But not only do you, when you think about the goodness of God, not only when God is good, you can also think about who God is good to. And I can tell you who God is good to. He's good to them who love him. If you love him, he's good to those who love him. He's, he's good to those who commits unto him. He's good to those who will trust him. He's good to those who will walk with him. He's good God. That's, that's who he's good to. He, he's good to all of those who loves him. He's good to all of those who trust him. He's good to all of those who believe in him. He's good to those who own him as Lord and Savior. And then why is God good? He's good because he's just a good God. You know, that's, you know the goodness of God is just who God really is. God, God doesn't have to work at being good. Goodness just naturally comes from God. He's a good God. Just this past week, I was watching the news and President, former President Obama was in Flint, Michigan. And President Obama was at Northwestern High School. He and Vice President Joe Biden for a Flint rally. And somehow or another, President Obama ends up in the gymnasium at Northwestern High School. And there's a basketball and some people out there on the basketball court. And they threw President Obama the basketball. And President Obama goes over to the corner, not a layup, not in the key, but he's over in the corner, in the right part of the court, in the corner. And he takes his jump shot. He goes up and he shoots that basketball. And as you're watching it, that basketball just goes right through the rim. Obama just walks off the court. He takes down his mask and he says one thing. He says, that's what I do. I want to tell you, that's what God does. God is a good God. If you, if you put God on the court of your life, when God takes a shot, shoo, that's what he does. He's a good God. He's the kind of God that if you give God the ball in his hand, God will take the shot from the half court of your life. He can hit a three point and make a way for you out of no way. He's the kind of God that will be good all the time. Wherever God is, he's good all the time. He's good when you are sick. He's good all the time. He's good every day. He's good Monday. He's good Tuesday. He's good Wednesday. He's good Thursday. Every Every day, he's a good God because that's what God does. Being good is not an accident with God. Well, here is the last idea of this unequal God. That our God is not only unequal because he's a great God. Our God is not only unequal because he is a good God. But then verse 8 says, our God is a gracious God. Listen to what it says. The Lord is gracious and the Lord is full of compassion. The Lord is slow to anger. And the Lord is of great mercy. Yes. What makes my God, what makes your God unequal is the mere fact that our God is a great God. And what makes him great is he's a God who has an almighty name. And he's a God who can meet all of our needs. That makes him great. And what makes him good is because of who he is, who he's good to, and why he's a good God. Yes, our God is a great God. He's a great God. He's a good God. Verse 8 says, our God is a gracious God. Look at that, gracious. Now, there are two things I want to say about the grace of God, and I'm done. The reason God, grace is so great, is first of all, it's unmerited grace. It's unmerited grace. You know, the grace of God is something that God knows that we need, but you know that you don't deserve it. It is unmerited grace. It's grace 
that you can't be so faithful that you deserve it. You can never work at earning the grace of God. You could never live so good that you deserve the grace of God. I want to remind you that even when you've done your very best, you still do not deserve the grace of God. The grace of God is unmerited. I'm glad the grace of God is unmerited because there is nothing in my life that I could ever do to deserve the unmerited grace of God because I need to tell you I'm weak and sometimes I'm weary and sometimes I get worn but grace gives me strength. Sometimes I fail. Sometimes I fall. Sometimes I get frustrated but grace picks me up. Sometimes I've been wrong but grace makes me right. Sometimes I just don't understand but grace gives me understanding. I want to tell you I'm living on God's unmerited grace. As a matter of fact I'm living on it right now. He woke me up this morning. I didn't deserve to be awakened, but he woke me up this morning and started me on my way. I'm living on unmerited grace. I should have been dead, sleeping in my grave, but grace has given me another chance. I never deserve the unmerited grace of God. I just thank him for that grace that's unmerited. Wait a minute. His grace is not just unmerited. His grace is also unmeasured. I just cannot measure the grace of God. And what I mean by measured is that, number one, I've discovered that the grace of God is inexhaustible. That every time I have taken out of my account grace from my spiritual account, every time I've taken some grace out, He's put more grace back in. And the reason he keeps putting grace back into my account because he knows that wine is going to mess up again. Wine is going to have another situation. Wine is going to have another issue. Wine is going to have another burden. He's going to need grace. I'm learning that I cannot exhaust the grace of God. Every time I make a withdrawal, he puts more grace back in my account. But not only is the grace of God inexhaustible, I've learned that sometimes I cannot even express in words the grace of God. I've learned that. I, I didn't understand that when I was younger. I didn't understand that growing up in the church. I didn't understand why people did what they did. But now that I've been through dangers, toils, and snares, now that I've had some ups and some downs, now that I've had some midnights, now that I've had some heartaches and some heartbreaks, I understand that sometimes I can't put in words the grace of God. I didn't understand what people were doing and why they did it, but sometimes the grace of God is absolutely unexpressible. Well, here's what I mean. Sometimes I've seen people just in church that would stand up, didn't say nothing, and just go waving their hand. That was because they just could not say a word. And sometimes I've seen people just stand up and just lift their hands to him because they couldn't say a word. And sometimes I've seen people just run around the church because they couldn't say a word of God. I got it now because sometimes all I can do with God is just raise my hand. Sometimes all I can do is just wave my hand. And sometimes I understand now when I used to see my mother on Sunday morning fold her arms and sit there on that amen corner and just close her eyes and do that. Wasn't saying a word. I know what was happening. Grace was working on her. I know what was happening. Grace was moving on her. I know what was happening. Grace was reminding her how good I am, how great I am. I need to tell you, I'm living on unmerited grace. I'm living on unmeasured grace. I'm living on grace every day. I'm walking by grace every day. I'm leaning on grace every day. I'm depending on grace because it's unmerited. It's unmeasured. I'm glad my God is an unequal God. I'm glad that can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like like the Lord. He walks with me. He talks to me. He tells me I am his own. Our God is a great God. Our God is a good God. Our God is a gracious God. Thank you for his grace. Thank you for being a good God. Thank you 
for your grace and thank you for your mercy. Amen and amen. Let me introduce someone to a God that is unequal. Maybe you have never encountered him. If you've been listening or watching our worship today, maybe I have convinced you that there is a God who's great and a God who's good and a God who's gracious. And if you believe that and have not confessed it, this is your moment. Or maybe you confessed it, but you've been out of church and you need to reconnect. This is your moment. If you live in this community and you're not connected to a Bible church, church of faith and fellowship, and you want to be, we welcome you here at Second Bible. If you need to confess that, we would love to hear that confession. This is your moment.
This morning, I want you to remember persons in prayer that we may not know of. If you have a name, please place that name in the comment section, section as we will pray for our intercessory prayer. I want you to give thanks to God, of course, for the well-being of Gene Hughes, who is now at home recovering from COVID. As well, as we continue to give praise for other members of our church who are recovering from but I also ask that you will remember Sister Connie Lynch and her family in prayer. Her daughter, Gwen Jenkins, has been undergoing some very difficult situations. And this past week, she was on life support. So I want you to remember Connie Lynch and her daughter, Gwen, and her family in prayer. There may be others we know not of. Remember them in prayer. Reverend James Perry will come now to lead us in the prayer of intercession. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for how you kept us and sustained us even through this time of distress. And, oh God, we ask that you would touch those who have need of a word, those who have a need of touch of a healing. Bless the sick, the shut in, the shut out everywhere. We thank you, oh God, that you allow us to come before your presence to say thank you. Thank you for life itself. Thank you for giving us the life of Jesus Christ as we walk hand in hand with the Lord, our Savior. Now, Lord, as we pray and lift up your name this morning, we thank you that you are able to do all things above and exceedingly and well. Now, Lord, we ask that you touch those who have infirmities that they have uh, experienced throughout this week. We ask, oh God, that you touch them right now from the crowns of their head to the soles of their feet. We'll be careful to give you the praise and give you all the glory. We pray for those who are on the front lines in the hospitals and in the areas of that are coming in this, of under this particular time of life. We pray for those church doors that open in your precious name. And we lift you up and just say thank you once again. We do thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God be the glory, another Sunday morning that uh, we've worshiped in spirit and in truth. I pray that you have been blessed by worship. If you are not a member of the church and you've been blessed and you want to bless us by giving to our church, you are more than welcome to do that. You can see on the screen the various ways of how you can give to our church. If you are a member of the church, I pray and hope you continue to be faithful with your giving, that even in the pandemic and even being not at church, if God is still providing for you and you are a believer, you should share what God has shared with you. As always, we're thankful for everything that everyone does to support the ministry of the church. Well, in this month of November, I trust that you will also be mindful of what we are going to be doing for families for Thanksgiving. As a member of the church, you know what we need to do. I trust that you would either give to the mission ministry as well, uh, and also for those of you who can and will, of course we know you, we've asked you to give turkeys as I have been told, we are almost at 20, and we only need a few more. And so I trust that we will get to the numbers we need as soon as we can, and then prepare ourselves for what we're going to do in December. Well, God bless you, and may God keep you is my prayer. I pray that you will continue to pray for me, 
as I try to continue to proclaim the gospel even in this pandemic and, uh, and also as we try in the church to remain connected in our faith and our fellowship. Let me bless you now. The grace, peace, and love of Jesus Christ be with each of you until we meet again. Amen.